I'm Mamie Locke, state senator serving the second district of Virginia that includes portions of Hampton, Newport News, Ports Portsmouth, and York County, not far from where we are right now. And I need to mention that the city of Hampton, where I live, is the oldest continuous speaking English community in the nation. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> As vice chair of the Virginia American Revolution 250 Commission, it is my special privilege this afternoon to introduce Barbara Ham Lee, the moderator of the panel discussion that we are about to hear on creating a multifaceted commemoration that is inclusive and meaningful to all Americans, a topic that is at the forefront of all of our planning efforts. Barbara Ham Lee is an award-winning journalist, television radio host, and diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice facilitator. As the owner of Sharing Info LLC, Barbara provides consulting support to organizations to, to strategically maximize media potential, market effectively, and protect their brand. She is best known as the executive producer and host of Another View, a weekly public radio talk show that discusses today's issues from an African-American perspective. Truly a local celebrity, Barbara is called on regularly to MC and facilitate programs, as well as to deliver motivational speeches throughout Hampton Roads and beyond. In addition, Barbara created a series of town hall meetings entitled Race, Let's Talk About It, in response to increasing tension surrounding race relations. Thank you, Barbara, for the groundbreaking work you've done, for being here today, and for leading what we know will be valuable discussions. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Ham Lee. You. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Locke. And you know, your, hopefully your ears were burning on Thursday. On our show, we did a program on the state of black women in honor of black history, I mean, in honor of uh, Women's History Month. And one of the questions that I asked our round table was, who is your muse? And Gaylene Knoyton, who is one of our round table pundits, screamed out, Mamie Locke. <laughs> and everyone started cheering on air. So thank you so very much for that. So, you know, as we know that this is the 250th anniversary um, of the Committees of Correspondence being started, I wonder what the Patriot leaders would think of the 2023 version. That's all you all out here. Would they be amazed at the number of people gathered? Would they be astonished at the diversity in the room? And just think, in another 250 years, those responsible for planning the quincentennial commemoration will look at the activities of this gathering for guidance. Let that sink in for just a moment. But have no fear, we are in excellent hands. It is my honor and pleasure to serve as the moderator for this esteemed panel as we discuss crafting a meaningful commemoration for all Americans. Please allow me to introduce our panelists. Ms. Christy Coleman is an innovator and leader in the museum field, having held leadership roles at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, and the American Civil War Museum. She now serves as the executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. Christy. <laughs> Yes, that one. Mm -hmm. Mr. Scott Stevenson fell in love with history as a kid growing up in Western Pennsylvania. He listened to family stories from the elders. He read biographies from the elementary school library and took road trips to historic sites. His first visit to Colonial Williamsburg was during the Winter Olympics of 1980. He watched the U.S. hockey team beat the USSR from his hotel room. So how about that? <laughs> Scott says, stories about people hooked me deep at the right age, and now I am blessed to work every day trying to make the same sparks happen in our rising generations. He is the CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution. Please welcome Scott Stevenson. 
Dr. Noel Trent is an accomplished public historian who serves as the Director of Interpretation, Collections, and Education at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. She oversees the museum's permanent and traveling exhibitions, collections, donations and acquisitions, education programming, and initiatives such as the NCRM's annual MLK birthday celebration, April 4th commemoration, and Ruby Bridges Reading Festival. And she also collaborates with a variety of partners, both here in the U.S. and internationally. Please welcome Dr. Nicole Trent. <laughs> Noel, Noel Trent, pardon me. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. And finally, Nathan, Nathaniel Shidley is the first president and CEO of Revolutionary Spaces, a new cultural organization dedicated to connecting people to the history and continuing practice of democracy through an encounter with two of the nation's most important revolutionary sites, Boston's Old State House and Old South Meeting House. Previously, Nat taught early American history at Wesley College and served as the Director of Public History for the Bostonian Society. Please welcome Nathaniel Shidley. <laughs> Nat. Nat. <laughs> yes, he said I can call him Nat instead of Nathaniel. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. So we've heard a lot this morning about people's perceptions and things that they expect when they come to museums. And you guys all have living experiences <laughs> in making that happen. So this session is called Crafting a Meaningful Commemoration for All Americans. It means a deliberate focus on inclusivity as necessary to accomplish the goal. So I wanna ask each of you very briefly to share at least one example of a program or an initiative that you have done that with inclusivity at the core and how you accomplish that goal. And I think I'll start with you, Nat. <laughs> <laughs> Great, um, thanks so much for the question. Sure. Uh, if you'll allow me the indulgence, I, I just, I, I think it's important when we talk about inclusivity to say out loud that it implies exclusion, right? And I think um, our sites, the Old State House and Old South Meeting House, we have to recognize are the product of a process of selective preservation, right? So many sites were not preserved, um, but the Old State House and Old South Meeting House were um, at a moment at the birth of our country's preservation movement in the second half of the 19th century. And they were, <clears throat> they were preserved um, through a movement among members of the elite in Boston in particular, um, who saw value in these sites as a tie back to the city's past and to the country's past. This was a moment of mass immigration um, into the United States. It was a moment where Boston's elite felt themselves uh, to be losing ground. The ground was shifting beneath their feet. Um, and the value of the old state house and old South meeting house was that certain families could point to those buildings and say, well, we represent real Boston because our uh, families were here at the time that those buildings were built. Um, all of you might just want to step back and let us continue to lead because um, we represent what Boston is really all about. And I say that um, before introducing the initiative that I want to share with uh, the audience today because I think um, as we've um, at our organization thought about how to um, engage new audiences, how to, how to put together programming that feels truly inclusive for all people, we recognize that we need to uh, acknowledge the burden of exclusion that is attached to the sites. Um, and it's mapped onto the landscape in Boston. Uh, there are a certain number of sites on Boston's Freedom Trail um, that tell the story of the revolutionary period, and we're all working at those sites to tell a more inclusive story. Story. Um, there's also a set of sites that uh, that tell the story of the struggle against slavery and uh, and civil rights, and those are on a separate trail. 
um, the Black Heritage Trail. And there's all kinds of reasons for the segregation of those two stories, but it's a reality in the landscape that we have to recognize. So w in 2020, um, we undertook, uh, uh, well, we really took a leading role in the city's commemoration of the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. One of our sites overlooks the Boston Massacre. Um, the other site was the place where Boston gathered every year uh, to remember the victims lost in the massacre on the anniversary beginning in 1771, the year after it had happened. Um, so we built in a, a whole year of programming um, to help people think about that anniversary. Um, and we chose to center the story on the figure of Crispus Attucks. And we did that. Attucks was one of five people killed in the Boston Massacre. He wasn't the center of reporting around the massacre in uh, 1770. But over time, Attucks was lifted up as a figure not just of history, but as a figure of memory. Um, he's lifted up by black abolitionists in the 1840s and 1850s as a way to respond to slaveholders and their allies who said, you can't put an end to slavery because what would you do with former slaves? Everybody knows they can't be citizens because they can't sacrifice on behalf of the common good. Okay, right. Let's get to so, what was the okay. program though. So <laughs> quickly here, right? He's, he's also used as a, as a, as a sort of emblem uh, of the, the, the struggle for racial justice by, um, by leaders of the civil rights movement. Um, and building the program around addicts allowed us to invite audiences to consider what we are actually doing when we are remembering our nation's founding, right? We are not having a conversation about our past. We are, in part but we are also having a conversation about who we are today and who we want to be tomorrow, right? So the figure of Christmas addicts allows us to see that, allows us to see how arguments about the past are really arguments about the nature of racial justice today. So we built a whole arc of programming, exhibits, public art installation, uh, commissioned a new play, um, a civic event that had a wide range of speakers reflecting on how this history sits with their own work today. Um, and I'm happy uh, as the conversation yeah, we'll get, we'll continues to unpack the, the elements of that. Right, exactly. Uh, I know thank that you for the some, indulgence there. So much. <laughs> <laughs> some struggles there, but I do want to hear just from you all, just give us the nuggets of what the event was, and then we can talk about the backstory mm -hmm. because that's really what people need to hear today. So, Noelle. Um, so, yes, I'm at the National Civil Rights Museum, which is located at the historic Lorraine Motel, where Dr. King was assassinated. So by our nature, we tell an inclusive story, and part of our mission is very explicitly uh, written to link past to present. Like, that's what we're expected to do. And so the initiative that really comes to mind for me was our I Am a Child uh, exhibition and programming that we did. In the summer of 2018, there was a family separation crisis, as many of you may remember, um, and that was particularly targeted at uh, Latinx children um, on the border, on the southwest border of this country. There was an artist, Paola Mendoza, and her photography partner, Kish Shabari, who uh, staged a I Am a Child photo shoot on the steps of New York's Customs and Immigration Enforcement. And they had signs that said, I am a child. And the sign template modeled the I am a man sign that was held during the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968. And I can get into more of that history as the conversation evolves. Well, we see this on social media and our, my immediate sense was, let me reach out to them, slide into their DM, her DMs, if you will, in a non-weird way. And <laughs> I said, I, essentially the message was, I'm not crazy. I'd love to work with you. I'm at the National Civil Rights Museum. Here's my work number and emails so you know I'm not crazy. <laughs> uh, and so she reached out. So we created a rapid response exhibition using those photographs initially and laying out what the issue was for folks so people actually had an idea what was happening. Uh, and then did a translation of uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights using Amnesty International's sort of abbreviated version, because if you've ever read it, it's a very long legalese document. So we had that in English and in Spanish. And then in September, September of that year, we did a photo shoot on the grounds of the motel. And so we had Memphis area children of all backgrounds participate, as well as uh, black men, some of whom were children 
1968, mm -hmm. one of whom was the son of the union organizer, T.O. Jones. And we had photographs of the kids by themselves, them with some of these black men, and it brought that movement together to say this is what we're putting out here is the continued question around humanity and human dignity. And that has helped draw the, the conversation forward. Okay, Stephen. Hmm. Yeah, so I guess the Museum of the American Revolution is new enough that I can just claim that as the project <laughs> here, <laughs> as opposed to an exhibition. Yeah. We just opened in 2017. I'm curious how many people have visited the museum. Hopefully, oh, lots, oh. excellent. Well, <laughs> um, so we opened in uh, April 19th of 2017. And um, I think one of the differences actually with like revolutionary spaces is we are a completely new building that rose out of the ground. So uh, we did not at a place like Monticello or Mount Vernon or other places that have a lot of sort of deep history or an institution that's existed for a long time. We were able to kind of imagine what kind of place we wanted this museum to be from the start. Our, our mission is to uncover and share surprising stories about the diverse people and complex events that sparked America's ongoing experiment in liberty, equality, and self-government. So it's right there from the very beginning that we wanted to tell a kind of 21st century story of the nation's founding, one that, that would be rooted in the sort of early uh, period from the late colonial period to the early republic, but also make sure that you realize that this was not an ancient story of orcs and wizards in the, you know, long ago, but uh, that we are all swimming in uh, a stream of history that is the revolution still continues. Our sort of spiritual godfather, as it were, um, is probably Benjamin Rush, who observed in 1787 that uh, there was a lot of debate about what do we mean by the American Revolution. I think we're still actually arguing about what, is that, what does that phrase mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Adams, of course, claimed that the revolution happened before the war broke out, but we dismiss him as a cranky New Englander trying to write himself into the, the history. <laughs> Our good Philadelphian Benjamin Rush <laughs> says, <laughs> okay, <laughs> says the American war is over, meaning the American the war, Revolutionary War, but this is not the case with the American Revolution, only the first act of the great drama is over. And so that is really the spirit of the, the kind of history that, um, that we decided to tell. We also, I think a, another key, and I'll wrap it up here, but just to sort of uh, relieve ourselves of the burden of saying we were telling the complete story of the American Revolution, I would say we tell a complete story in that you get the cast of characters, but we wanted to go deeper with individuals and communities put into predicaments so that you build those kind of empathy muscles and connection. And you have a feel for the landscape of what we mean by the American Revolution without feeling that, you know, oh my gosh, we missed the Battle of McGillicuddy's Mill and we didn't, you know, uh, et cetera. So, so that's a yeah. story, not the story. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think any of us should be able to claim that we've, you know, you have the whole uncovered it all. Yes. Christy. So, anyway. so <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to, go to a completely different era, right? So um, the American Civil War, we just concluded the, the sesquicentennial uh, in 2015. And I will say the primary product there was also a museum completely mm -hmm. reimagining and creating the American Civil War Museum in, in Richmond. But more specifically, it was a conversation with our community about, quite frankly, reclaiming the narratives of the American Civil War. Because, um, you know, there's sort of this saying, uh, the North won, so they were kind of done, and the South lost, so they had the most cost, mm -hmm. in that Southerners revamped America's understanding of the Civil War from this lost cause narrative. Wasn't really about slavery, brother against brother, states' rights. And this permeated the American landscape. And the problem with it, it simply wasn't true. The historical record in the American Civil War is rich and it is, I mean, okay? <laughs> and what was so great, especially after we did the merger with the Museum of the Confederacy and actually got into those archives, 
<laughs> um, it, 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 things were extraordinarily clear. So how do you do that? How do you create programming? How do you create exhibition that doesn't just do a lens pivot, but literally brings narratives back into the whole the way people lived it? And so when we did a people's contest, uh, is the name of the exhibition that we created for this new facility that we uh, finally opened to the public in 2018. This was the first time that we talked about the American Civil War as, as not just about choice, but continuing choice. The idea that all Southerners were on board or all Northerners were against slavery, all of that, again, patently false. And we talked about these, we talked about the war not just in a chronological perspective, but along certain themes that repeated throughout the war. We made a deliberate choice to include, again, people and voices and images that had been completely, I mean, just stripped. You know, very few, our visitors would walk through and they, the, one of the first faces they would see um, is, a, is a Cherokee, uh, a member of the Cherokee tribe. And they wanted to know why because the Cherokee were one of the four indigenous nations that aligned with the Confederacy because they were slave traders themselves, or they were engaged with it, or they had some beef against the United States, which was kind of clear. <laughs> um, but, there were 16, but there were 16 other indigenous nations that aligned with the United States. And, and their stories and their soldiers were never included. The Chinese Americans who made their way from California to join regiments. The agency of black people in this conflict had been, again, completely stripped. You know, there were slaves and then the white people set them free. Well, no, <laughs> right? You have over a million, a million African Americans who run away during the course of the war. Um, over 200,000 black men will join the United States Army and Navy, and, 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 and 14, of, uh, 14 of them will receive the Medal of Honor. I mean, these are people who, who let alone women, not just staying home making socks and tending the wounded, <laughs> you know, serving as spies. And I mean, it, again, the story was so much richer. And so that I think is the kind of, and, and what it did is that the conversations that were started because of the collective work of 21 organizations, and here's the big piece here, 21 plus organizations in the city of Richmond got together and said, we have to get it right. And so there were cultural institutions, educational institutions um, uh, 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 that, that got to, the, the universities that got together to say, how could we do this? Because I will tell you, among the first meetings that I had in 2009 um, with uh, donors uh, about the potential of, of what the centennial could do for us, they said, we are sick of the Civil War and we're not going to give you money. Mm. And they, what they were sick of was the Confederate story. What they were sick of was the contentiousness that had been surrounding that. So us coming together as a collaborative gave us an extraordinary amount of power and an extraordinary set of opportunities to um, collaborate and share resources and bring our community along with us. And what was so remarkable is when we and this is my last comment. When we, when we did the, when we did the um, final big event on April 4th, it's always April 4th. <laughs> it's April 4th um, of 2015 on the grounds of the state capitol, we had um, USCT reenactors uh, joining uh, other units to, to march into Richmond as they had historically. On the Capitol Square, we had, you know, speeches that were given. We had every organization, you know, with tents and learning. What I say is that we were astonished because we had built this audience over the seven years of the extraordinary diversity. And I can tell you, as the only black woman to run a Civil War museum in the United States, <laughs> <laughs> to see at least a third, if not half, of the audiences starting to come out being people of color who had completely cut off this period of time. 
because they had never been included, be on those grounds with us that day, that was the success. So one of the questions that was asked earlier today was the whole idea of how do you talk to your board? How do you talk to those <laughs> Thank you for who, that question. <laughs> you know, because you led right into it, Chris. But, but honestly, I mean, what kinds of conversations mm. have you all had to have? And, and mm. what was your thought process behind how you pull together a group of people who probably may not want to go in the direction that you want to go mm -hmm. with your organization um, to make that change? Steve, let's start with you. Yeah, so uh, we call that dancing between the raindrops. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have to say, you know, my board is v very diverse um, uh, in all ways and, and politically, for sure. And I think one of the keys, and it actually, uh, I think John Dichtel this morning flashed up this report by uh, this great organization, More in Common, mm -hmm. called Diffusing the History Wars. And a lot of what that report was looking at is the... Um, the sort of perception gap that we have about what we assume when certain words or phrases are used or someone's coming from a different political perspective or a different demographic group, mm -hmm. what we assume their attitudes toward elemental parts of American history would be. And I, I have found like paying attention to language has been a theme today is really important because actually there is so much more overlap. I mean, most people, I've had only one experience of a board member who just decided he was too conservative, you know, for, just couldn't do it. we were too inclusive, right? And, but wow. most, most people agree with the statement that American history is one that is of great achievements and terrible errors that need to be learned and understood and, and corrected. And so um, I think just taking the time, I found just taking the time to sort of talk and if people sort of raise a, you know, I will occasionally be teased a little bit, oh, you guys are way too woke, you know, for me or whatever, but they stay, you know, and, and, and are, are supportive. And I think it's because um, we engage, we show them how inclusive history is accurate history, right? One in five people living where we are sitting here on the east coast of America in 1776 were people of African descent. So not teaching that history, that is not accurate history, but it's history that can be inspiring. It can be a source of, of great pride. And, um, you know, anyway, so far, knocking on my wood chair, it's gone okay. Nat, I'm wondering <laughs> if you had a, a tougher struggle with those families that were there from the beginning. Yeah, mm. no, I, <laughs> in fact, um, I, I think that we had an advantage um, in that we, we had to go through a really deep set of strategic conversations as part of considering a merger mm. um, that, that you know, brought two longstanding organizations together. Um, those weren't easy conversations, um, but the boards of both organizations took real ownership of that. Um, you know, and in any merger conversation there, you, you have to overcome the sense of, mm. well, we have our way and you, you have that. your way and, and you have to get past that us versus them dynamic. Um, and the way to do that in those merger conversations mm. was to constantly come back to the question of, um, the public we're trying to serve. What is the highest and best service that the Old State House and Old South Meeting House can have for the public? Um, and, and our board and our staff really came together and all of the stakeholders that we were in dialogue with around the understanding that these buildings, right? The Old State House was the seat of government in Boston at the time of the revolution. Um, Old South Meeting House was the most important place for popular politics because it was the largest indoor gathering space. That tension um, between those two spaces drove the genesis of the questions that drove the revolution, right? Uh, there are questions about representation, but not in a, in a sort of civics class kind of way. There are questions about how is my voice heard? Heard, right? Who speaks for me? What's my recourse if I'm silenced or overlooked? You know, they're really, it's a question about what we mean when we say we the people, right? And our, all of us agreed those questions that were born in these spaces uh, were not answered um, in any final definitive way during the revolutionary period. Um, so that there would be real power in bringing people together 
all of us still engaged in grappling with those questions. What do we mean when we say we the people to have those conversations in that space, to feel ourselves to be part of a 250 year current of argument and work, um, right? The thing that unites us is that we argue over these questions and our board has so committed itself to that vision um, that uh, really I think there's, they're, they're there through thick and thin and it's not easy work, right? This is work that is, as we've been hearing um, in this polarized environment is going to cause some bumps in the road, uh, but I don't think um, our board is is going to be shaken in any way by those by the by the feedback that we might get. They're they're in it for the long haul. Noel, let me ask you this question: um, How do you ensure that multiple voices are at the table during your planning process or when you're preparing for any kind of a program, and that they have true agency and it's not window dressing? Well, you know. That's always the challenge for this field and, and mm -hmm. for museums. And so um, with any initiative that we're doing, whether it's exhibitions or any sort of dialogue or program that we have, we think about who's represented, right? Like who's affected by this? And then who do you bring to the table? When we did our uh, 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, there's a lot of people who wanted to be involved. Mm -hmm. But we also had to make sure that they were community members, like to make sure AFSCME, which is the union that represented the mm. sanitation workers, that they had a seat at the table. Mm. And so part of it is really sitting down and taking a look at that and then saying, well, whose voice has and I heard? And how do I get to that? I think most of the time when I've been in, whether it's at the National Civil Rights Museum or in other organizations where we've had these conversations about stakeholders or whose voice needs to be at the table, we sometimes think, well, I don't know anybody, so let's just move on. And it's like, yeah, that's part of that, <laughs> but can I make a phone call? You know, we all have networks, we all know people. Mm -hmm. So I've been in situations where I was like, well, this isn't gonna work because we don't have a Latino voice and we don't have an LGBTQ plus voice. So somebody need to make a phone call because we need that voice in the room. Or at the very least, I need to say, somebody needs to say, what do they think? Can someone find out? Like that's mm -hmm. part of that. But the other entry point for a lot of historically underrepresented groups is the fact that um, there's an economic inequity, right? So we are quick to want people to volunteer, mm -hmm. particularly their skill sets and service. Mm -hmm. And as we think of the 250th and all the activities that we want, okay, so you want an artist of color to come in and do a mural or do some painting or to create a production or something, but then you don't want to pay them scale. That's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're gonna ask for them to incur the expenses and reimburse, and you'll reimburse them later. Well, then that's a barrier for mm -hmm. them because they don't have the same generational wealth. They don't have, you know, they're artists, and typically artists of color are also working artists. So some of them who are fortunate work in the field of art, either at galleries or at, art te at uh, schools, but then a whole lot of them have other jobs. Mm. So if you're asking for them to do a project that's gonna cost $5,000 and you're gonna reimburse them for $5,000, they still don't have the $5,000 to do the project. So part of the work in that when you're bringing them to the table to participate, thank you for the invitation, they're grateful to be there, but are you paying them? And I get you don't wanna pay them the whole money up front, but can you give them 2,000 up front? Mm -hmm another thousand part way through, mm -hmm. another thousand. And even people who, are, you, who you're asking to be engaged in thought work, if they're pulling out more than like four or five, you know, if this gets to be more than like a one-off and it shouldn't be, mm -hmm. you need to make sure folks are com compensated. And I don't mean compensated like we're paying you, we're gonna give you dinner and lunch and mm -hmm. gas money. I mean, no, they need an honorarium. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a website, I think it's called Wage for Work, that mm -hmm. does this great um, sliding scale of, institutions based off of your budget and what you should be paying folks according to the task. That's what we need to do. If we want real equity and real inclusion, particularly with historically underrepresented folks, we have got to make sure we value folks time and put a dollar sign on that. I'm curious, one other question for you. Since you run the National Civil Rights Museum, is there an assumption that you don't have a, a diversity problem? Well, I don't run it. Oh, well, okay. I know, I know, I know but you I got to go back to Memphis. But <laughs> I like to have a job. But you, but you are the curator and, and, yes, and yes, 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 programs yes, yes. and so forth. So is there an assumption that there is not a diversity issue? 
There is an assumption, but we have to look at what diversity means, right? You know, we tend to think, oh, if it's a predominantly black organization, they don't have a diversity problem. Well, what's the other? There's age diversity. There is uh, gender recognition. You know, we have folks on staff who are non-binary. Um, you know, and so we have other elements that are and it's okay for white people to participate too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They can, they can come. We, we got them too. You know, I, I asked that because on my show, um, people, my show is a call-in talk show. And um, so often people will call in and say, I'm not black, but... <laughs> because they feel like they're not in included. And they are. It is inclusive. Yes. And we want everybody to be it's there, right? Absolutely, it is. And as part of our permanent galleries, when you walk through, you'll see that there's a lot of, I won't say allyship, uh, accomplices. Joan mm -hmm. Trump Hour mm -hmm. was not an ally. She was an accomplice. Like, so mm -hmm. you see that there's this legacy of allyship that we see both in our staff, or sorry, accompliceship that we see in our staff and in our board and in our community partners. Now, what did you do to make sure that you had voices, a variety of voices at the table as you planned your programming? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of the points that Noel has made are, are right on point for our experience as well. Um, I, I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge um, that this is long-term work. Uh, and that we have to enter into these conversations with stakeholders and partners, um, recognizing that it's not transactional. Um, so th it's about building trust over the long term. It's about being open and transparent about where we are right now uh, as an institution or as individuals who are entering into these conversations. It's about truly being willing to move uh, one's expectations. So in our case, um, the, the commemoration that I was talking about built around Crispus Attucks, um, there was a content touchstone that was an exhibit um, called Reflecting Attics, which was really imagined by staff as walking people through the memory part of the story because um, there's really not a whole lot of strong evidence to allow us to tell the story of Attucks as a person. Um, and we, so we engaged um, in building that, uh, that exhibition. We had uh, a, a series of charrettes um, with a, a, a large group of uh, voices, um, museum specialists and historians, yes, but uh, folks representing community organizations, uh, activists, a whole wide range of folks whose voices were really important, helping us chart what the content would be. And we got so much pushback on the idea that we couldn't tell the story of who Addicts was. Um, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, that one of the um, one of the Participants in the charrette said, you know, we don't know everything about George Washington either, but nobody says, well, yeah, there we go. We don't know everything, so we can't tell the story. Um, so we had to reimagine the exhibition. Um, and it was a stronger exhibition because of that. So I think it, it's often um, being receptive, demonstrating the receptivity, acknowledging where we've made mistakes, being willing to be uh, true and honest, and keeping at it for the long haul, right? So um, we also built out of that work with uh, leaders from a couple of our uh, most committed board members, uh, a long-term advisory group. Um, uh, they're calling themselves the Addicts Collective. Um, and it's, mm. it's really um, a semi-independent uh, sort of affinity group of folks who really want to build a sense of ownership over this story and over the story uh, of um, people of African descent in Boston's revolutionary history. Um, and that's been great, but it's long-term work. It's still growing, uh, and it's going to take a lot more time. So we, we can't just expect we're going to sit down for this project and get it done. Exactly. Stephen and Christy, I'm going to ask the two of you this question, because you do hear people say, well, we don't have an LGBTQ person because we don't know one or we don't have whoever. I'm just, I just picked that as one example. Can you give some concrete ways for people who are particularly working in communities that are not necessarily hugely diverse, that they can go find the right voices still that they need at the table in order in the planning? I'll start with you. Well, Philadelphia is not hard to find <laughs> every kind of community. I mean, we are such a diverse community as Philadelphia has been since the 18th century, mm -hmm. 17th century even. Um, so I would say it, it, it hasn't been so much of a struggle okay. um, that I would say for us. I think the, um, one of the challenges is just uh, when you're working in organizations, you all know this, you'll feel seen. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. I mean, just 
things are coming at you. You're, you know, we're open seven days a week. Uh, you've got all this work coming. And uh, it, can, it can be a challenge sometimes, particularly it falls on staff, to sort of make sure there's space in the timeline because you can't, as you were saying, you, you can't just assume that I can pick up the phone. I have scheduled my check-in with uh, X community uh, for these two weeks in August, and therefore that that will happen on that timeline. And I've talked specifically about exhibits at the museum. We've um, we try to push out a few years ahead with kind of what's what's percolating, but we don't necessarily always make a decision. We have sort of like a group of ideas that are floating. And a lot of times uh, what gets prioritized and put on the schedule is because of sometimes a happy accident. So a good example is we have just opened an exhibition uh, just a couple of weeks ago called Black Founders about uh, the Fortin family. Some of you may have heard James Fortin was a born uh, to a free black family in Philadelphia in 1766. And we're exploring, uh, first of all, his life. He was a combat veteran at age 14 and a prisoner of war at age 15, and it just got really more interesting and fascinating from there. And looking at three generations of this family in the hundred years between the Declaration of Independence and, um, and Reconstruction. And it was an idea that had been floating, because this was a character who's part of our core exhibition. So we've been talking about James Fortin every day since 2017 and just sort of starting to reach out. And so um, our curator of special exhibitions, Matt Skick, uh, was haunting uh, Ancestry.com and managed to like make a connection to a descendant that then unlocked all these incredible groups of cousins, many of whom didn't know each other from the West Coast, from Tennessee, from Chicago, from right across the river in Camden. <laughs> And all of a sudden, there's artifacts coming out of the family. There's you know all these amazing um, connections. But that's something that we couldn't have scheduled that happy accident to have happened, right? So you're doing you know sort of having those ideas bubbling there, and uh, maybe trying to find ways to not let the tyranny of time um, cut off the opportunity to be sort of have deep engagement with okay. uh, people who'd be represented in. Christy? Um, in listening to my peers, there's a, there's a few things that are percolating in my brain about how we engage communities. And I will tell you um, that generally my longstanding concern is that as museum community, we are often extractive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning we approach communities for what they can give to us. And we rarely, if ever, have the conversation about what is it that we can give to those communities that have been underrepresented or not represented at all. And so, and that's a conversation that I will say is being had to a certain degree at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, um, because recently with the support of, a, of an amazing uh, funder, we have um, the, um, what we would call our Indigenous Peoples Initiative. And when we first started out, we weren't even sure what to do with it. We just knew that we were woefully inadequate in really understanding Virginia's Indigenous community um, and not just their widget making. Because that's really easy, right? Mm -hmm. We can show visitors how they make nets or how they you know, fry food or how they, but we didn't have a, a stronger a strong enough understanding of cosmological belief systems and, and um, you know, really understanding social and familial dynamics. Everything had previously been pivoted through a Western lens, right? And so we really have allowed the Indigenous Peoples Initiative to be organic. Um, the person um, that has been that is is doing this work on our staff, the principal, sort of the, the main person we have two, um, are themselves indigenous, and they have been going into the various communities, Virginia Indian communities within our say, two or three hour radius, and and actually doing things in the community, workshops in the communities, things that over time. Um, we have learned how, okay, so the widget making in some instances is really good because it's helping to bring back 
some um, traditional uh, activity. But at the end of the day, I'm always concerned about making sure, regardless of the institution, that we're putting as much back into the communities because that's a way that you also build trust. That we're listening to the communities and, and being and co-curating with them. We did an exhibition um, about a year, year and a half ago called Focused. And it was about, uh, it, it, it featured photography, early 20th century photography of the Virginia Indian communities. And there were a lot of people who said, why are you doing that? That doesn't have anything to do with the settlement of Jamestown or da, da, da. Because for us, it meant explaining and showing point blank to our audiences that Virginia Indians do still live here. And in some areas are thriving. Um, and in spite of literally um, like the you know, Racial Integrity Act of 1924 that said you were either white or colored and, and essentially tried to legally erase indigenous peoples, right? Um, I mean, there's all of these kinds of things. So I would just encourage you, as you're talking about how you aid communities and how you get more diversity, that stop thinking of it as so transactional and actually make it intentional in terms of relationship building. And that's very, very different. Um, and I think that, um, I guess the last thing that I'll say on, on that particular point is that I have to go back to Noelle's comment because this has honestly been a concern, especially if you, and I know so many of you in the room, are state institutions. And more often than not, your uh, board may be legislatively appointed, you know, gubernatorially appointed, there may be some self-appointment, but more often than not, the rules for those boards say you can't even reimburse people for their travel, which right then and there mm. prevents who is actually serving on these governing bodies because they cannot afford, and you have said, and you have excluded them because they can't afford to travel to wherever it is you're gonna go or to you know, pay for that overnight hotel. We can do, we, and here's the interesting thing, at least here in Virginia, we can pay for our legislative members, mm. <laughs> but we can't pay for our community members. Mm. And if you have something like that, um, it does, it, to me, it creates a barrier that shouldn't be there when we're talking about institutions that are supposed to represent the richness of our states. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A question for each of you. Now, we only have about 10 minutes left before we open the things up to mm -hmm. the audience. So. Um, sure. Yes. <laughs> I know we Does not come natural to this crowd. <laughs> but, and this is one of my, my um, pet peeves, if you will, when any of these types of commemorations, like we're talking about with the 250 and so forth. And I want to know, what, it, what do you do to intentionally market to the communities that need to know that your event is happening? Because we do these massive marketing things, but they're not reaching underserved communities. They're not reaching communities um, of color. They're not reaching communities that you really want to bring into the conversation. So, Nat. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I, to be perfectly frank, I don't think that the solution lies in marketing. I, I think because marketing can't overcome where trust doesn't exist. Marketing can't overcome the mapping of people's behaviors over long periods of time. Um, marketing might be able to make folks aware of what one is doing, but that's not necessarily enough to incentivize participation, taking advantage of the opportunities. Um, I think the most successful way um, to reach out and engage um, new communities, new audiences, in addition to the very important points that have already been made around how we work with partners and advisors is truly through collaboration and partnership. So um, if you want to find a way to reach an audience you're not currently serving, 
find a partner that is serving that audience and co-create the program, mm -hmm. co-build the program around a question that is authentically relevant to the audience you would like to engage, um, who already have trust and opportunity um, to, to bring people, um, to give them confidence to engage and do it uh, through that kind of partnership, understand that in so doing, you may lose some control over the shape of the story that you're telling or the nature of the commemoration that you're launching. But um, I don't think you can get the outcome you're looking for just by throwing more marketing dollars at the problem. Okay, Noel. Yeah, uh, to echo his point, I think that the other thing is that when you're letting people create their own question, shut up when they create their answer mm -hmm. like you cannot you cannot mold it you got to really sit there and it's really difficult sometimes to just sit there and let them tell you what they want because people know right uh, but the other big thing i think is the issue with the field at large is not all of us are doing marketing in the same way that corporations are mm -hmm. and the reality is is that our competition is not each other our competition is Starbucks, our competition mm -hmm. is Chick-fil-A, our competition is Macy's. Because mm -hmm. anytime they do something new, it changes how people receive information, how people engage information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're three or four steps behind, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really need to think about that. So I think digital marketing is really important. And I've talked to some smaller history organizations and they're like, well, we have a Facebook. Well, now Facebook is skewing older. That's not the thing, right? Well, TikTok is getting Wait, us- Wait, it's not? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, boom. Sorry, Steve. Uh, I am. <laughs> um, but, you know, and TikTok's a little problematic, but we have to really think through and, and really pay attention to how folks are getting their information because that's going to really change uh, who's engaged and how they're engaged. We have- brought on at the museum a social media manager who's very young uh, and has her own following. And because of that, she's created some really great videos on Instagram of us promoting the museum, right? But it reflects what that, you know, 20 somethings are interested in. And sometimes we just have to open ourselves up to think in that way. That doesn't take away our historical integrity, but it, it will get people to recognize that we are a trusted source. Mm. Well, and the whole idea, if you're going to plan a 250 yeah. uh, a commemoration, you want people to come. And mm -hmm. so you've got to put out a message that um, will entice people to come. But there are also avenues that reach specific communities that we ignore. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree with that, Stephen? And what do you guys do, too? Yeah, so everything you said, I agree with. I'd say um, one of the things I've I've come to appreciate more and more is um, is some of it just comes down to the difference between handwork and mechanized work. I mean, it is, it's like running a political campaign of building connections and, and trust particularly. So one of the things we tried for the first time with this uh, Black Founders exhibition is to form an exhibition committee some of which was pointed toward helping us fundraise. So some of the people on that committee were there, they were giving, they were helping connect us to foundations, other funders. But a lot of people who were there because we, through connections, through introducing them to the museum, they saw and believed in what we were trying to do. And then again, helped us to connect out into the communities. And it's dramatic change in the last couple of weeks, just in the demographics of our visit, visitation and our entrance surveys. Like it, it, and people coming in and saying, oh, you know, the challenge, a challenge we have is A, you call something the Museum of the American Revolution, and that brings all kinds of associations about what's the story, whose story is included in there. Then you put it in a beautiful neoclassical building designed by Robert A.M. Stern in this sort of sanitized, you know, neighborhood where everything was torn down in the 1950s um, in Philadelphia. And um, so you have a, you, you're starting a few steps back. And so I just realized that a lot of it is, it can be frustrating because it's not fast. You know, it's not, oh, we'll do this ad campaign and boom, they will come. It is one at a time building that trust. And then you have these incredible advocates, ambassadors. Uh, and that's what we're, we're starting to see is people just will speak uh, and they are trusted voices in their communities and, and uh, you know, it's a process. Okay. We're early on in it. Ms. Christie. 
So what you're really getting at is, should we be investing in, in, uh, <laughs> in uh, media outlets where people of color in particular mm. or um, where they are? And the answer is, yes, we should. Mm. You're talking the, also to an audience that uh, at best uses three to six percent of their budget for marketing purposes because they're just trying to cover the basics. Mm -hmm. So the question then, and what mm -hmm. many will often do, is they will um, put out that message or try to put out that message in the imagery that they put on social media or in their commercial or in their ads, right? I mean, we, we saw it in our Virginia 250 ad. <laughs> get a couple brown faces, get somebody in a wheelchair, Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, and I'm not making fun of that. What I'm saying is that's how we have to uh, approach it mm -hmm. because we don't often have the financial resources to segment the way mm -hmm. we want. Or mm -hmm. we segment in Black History Month and Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. Or Native, people, Native American Month. That's when we'll segment. And we'll do a really like quick, fast, you know, hard piece, and then we're out and nobody hears for you for the next 11 months, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it is always this really interesting um, piece. And, and, I, and I think it would be an interesting experiment to a certain degree. What would happen if the, the, the traditional or standard overall um, marketing of a, of a museum is kind of floated out once a month but you focus, you decide you want to focus mm -hmm. on one community for an entire year. What mm -hmm. could that look like? Mm -hmm. uh, where the majority of the, mar of the dollars go to, toward the communities that you're trying to, to get to, mm -hmm. not the ones you already got. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that would be an interesting experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I'm bold enough to do it yet. Yeah, see, I didn't have to say it, right? You should try it. If there are any funders okay. in the audience, right. that would be interesting. Right. Audience, get ready. If you guys have questions, you can start to line up at the microphones. Um, but the final question I want to ask each of you, and literally, guys, it's 2 o'clock now, so we want to be sure <laughs> we, have, we have stuff. But when you plan your 250 anniversary of the American Revolution, what will success look like? Mm. for you. Mm. Noel. I had a feeling you were gonna call me first. But that's <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think success will look like for me, number one, I'm a 20th century institution. I mean, we mm. do 400 years of history, but sure. primarily people identify us as a 20th century institution. Success looks like for me of people recognizing that they have a part in this complex story, mm. right? Um, where I get the most joy in this work is just by talking to people, finding out their story and saying, you know, there are historians who would kill, <laughs> literally, <laughs> to get access to that thing you're showing me, right? Mm -hmm. To say someone, mm -hmm. that experience that you have that you're just brushing off, please stop right there because that story has value. Mm -hmm. I would love more Americans throughout this country to realize that this little story that they have, and it's a lot of times it's just within their family, it's the quilt that they pass down, it's the story that they have, to realize you're part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And have people say, I'm a part of it. And it has nothing to do with whether or not I have citizenship papers. It has everything to do mm -hmm. with how I participate in this society. That's what success would look like for me. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, so as, as a staff, um, we bandy the phrase around a lot uh, to change the nation's relationship to its revolutionary history, which has a lot of power for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, our vision statement is to ensure that the promise of the American Revolution endures. And I think we, we would love to see much more sort of civic engagement, but, but more important than that is I think in the work we really, you know, our, we talk a lot about our relationship with civics education and I actually think in the history museum sphere, we're the prebiotic for civics, right? You know, because we're in the empathy business, right? And I think you, oftentimes civics education focuses on the, the manual and it usually is sold to you as some version of eat your vegetables, they're good for you, right? And 
I raised two children into their 20s, and that was not a successful strategy for getting them <laughs> to, to comply, head. right? And so, but I think that what the history, the, the stories of real people, of seeing that the system of government that we want to function better than it does now is the result of real people in real predicaments trying to make their world better, trying to create this more perfect union. And if you approach it that way, really leaning into the storytelling and the human connection, I think it's gonna produce better results than simply pouring all of our funds into, here's the three branches of government, right? Gotcha. So anyway, okay. now, more heart. What, was, what will <laughs> success look like to you? I, I want to come back uh, to the conversation in the morning and, and uh, John Dichtel's uh, two points, because I think, Noel, I share your, your sense of, we, I would, the way I would put it is, um, I would love it if we engage a wide, broad audience and leave everyone with an understanding that they are founders too, right? Because the work begun 250 years ago is still work ongoing today, and I have an important Place in that work, um, I'm inspired to lean in and um, and keep moving it forward. Um, but the second piece is, I think um, it's not successful if we don't leave behind uh, a, a deeper conviction of the importance of the historic resources that we care for mm. and the value of the field that we belong to. Right? Public history is important not because it's about the past, but because it's about the future um, or where we are today. And and I think we need to put that case forward and and let people really feel what that means. Okay, Christy? Nothing to add. Word. Nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for panel. saving us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. All right, I'll start here because I saw you jump up first. <laughs> Oftentimes, most of our museums are, are, are predominantly white. Most of our uh, most of the staff does not, does not come from the community, especially mm -hmm. the black and brown communities that surround our sites. Mm -hmm. um, how can we one get more people into our sites, uh, people of color, um, and especially there's the educational um, component. Uh, most people in the museum have a master's degree or the baseline of their their bachelor's. Um, and All right, Christy, since you had the shortest answer for the last one, I'll let you do Well, I mean, I will tell you, one of the things that we have done at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, particularly in the last 18 months, is we took a real, really, really careful look at every single position and description. Some of these are legacy positions. Some of the qualifications for them, frankly, um, were more gatekeeping than requirement. So that's the first thing you do, is you look at what's really there in the job description. And then it's about where you uh, put it, where you're actually actively recruiting for these roles. Um, sometimes it's other language, um, like, you know, we, we're, because again, state agency, we are required to say there's gonna be background checks. Well, that's great, but a background check, if something comes up, doesn't necessarily mean it disqualifies you for a job. Right? And so for us to be intentional to say, we do this, but it doesn't disqualify you. Right? It just depends on the job right? or, the, or the crime or how long ago it was or, or whatever. Um, and then there is this piece about uh, we changed our HR function from being one where it was just um, benefits and, and analysis and discipline to human resources and professional development. Our strategic plan that was actually started at our frontline level, we did strategic planning from the front lines. And, and so the result is what they said they wanted. 
So, um, for example, we had a young lady, we have a, a, a young lady who had expressed to me early in, she says, I work in housekeeping, but I have always really been interested in curatorial. Taking a couple classes on my own, and in my mind, I'm immediately thinking, okay, you know, there are trainings that can help her be an exhibit tech, right? I mean, there, there are things that can be done that may not require an, a, a degree, a bachelor's, or, but it's a skill set. I mean, I think... And, and so those, it's those kind of things. So what we have done with all of these organizations that JYF belongs to, we number one consolidated because we realized that every department had their own membership, <laughs> right? That we could tier three basically at everybody just, you know, uh, just by consolidating that. And then taking the courses that were available through our associations and allowing any employee, regardless of their work area, to take those classes that are of interest to them to build and then that gets built into their performance evaluations and their plans for the, so there's a way to do this. You, again, you just have to be intentional about it. And have we stumbled? Absolutely. But I think overall what it's done is it's helped the majority of our employees believe and know that there is an opportunity for professional growth. And whether that means they professionally grow and they stay with us, or they professionally grow and they take those skills out there. Um, I, some of you have heard me say this before, and this is my last comment. You know, there's this thing of what happens when you invest in your employees and they leave. True. Well, what happens if you don't invest in them and they stay? <laughs> <laughs> and so I lean on the side of let's invest in these people so they can grow and enhance our field. Barbara? That's, okay. I know, that's what I thought it was going to be. That's the lady right. here. Go ahead. We, we go back and forth from side to side. Hi, Liz. Hi, Christy. Uh, I'm glad we're already talking because I have a question for you. Um, during your talk, you gave a very um, interesting tidbit, which is that during the 150th of the Civil War anniversary, your museums looked at how to reclaim the narratives and tell a more richer and fuller and inclusive story. And I'm curious in that process, this is weird for me as a scholar of the revolution to be looking towards the Civil War, <laughs> but do you have any best practices, practices to avoid, tips and tricks for how we might look at doing that in our own organizations for the 250th? You got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Follow me on Twitter and I'll be happy to tell you. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, it. it you got to go back to the scholarship, right? I mean, you got to go back to the to the source material, and and the scholarship is more than just what was written by the dominant culture. There's archaeology that will help us. There is there are, there are oral histories that will help us. There, as was mentioned, there are family bibles and information in there that that we that enable us to see things a, a lot differently. And um, and we just have to be able to shift our paradigm of how we. Think about what that research and scholarship is, because there is a bias towards the written. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I tell people, I say, you know, the Hemings family, they've been saying for since <laughs> 250 years who they were. And, and, you know, the documents supported it, but that DNA, right? So we can use those also as connections. Yes, sir. Like to ask you a question, because I know that four and five of you are in the 13th hour. So I'd like to ask you a question that we're getting, and I'm sure some of my other colleagues mm. that are not 13th hour, how do you make this 1776 focus commemoration mm. relevant to states that didn't exist? Mm -hmm. In some cases, they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, or perhaps the entire panel, I'm curious what, uh, what answers or suggestions you might have. Okay, we're going to have to have one of y'all because they will kill me. All right. And so, since you, since no, no else since is going to run this. Jamie, from. he's so gentle oh, looking. trust me. <laughs> well, I'm I've from the great me. state of Tennessee, and I'm, I'm wearing my Tennessee pin as, as the Tennessee delegation is. Um, for those of us who tend to be outside of the 13 colonies, I think we have to just settle in with how awesome our stories are. Right. Um, I think some of us, yes, you, we may not have had the British 
1776 story, but there are other stories. There's French, there's Spanish. There are other stories and they all feed, feed into how this country was created. We have to own the fact that we've got some great stories in our state. We have to own the fact that we've got great diversity. Uh, the city of Memphis was saved from the verge of disappearing by a black man in the 19th century, Robert Church, who ended up being, you know, uh, Mary Church Terrell's family, you know? So those are the sort of things that we've got to settle into. Does it date back to 1776? Maybe not, but if you're in Florida, you got St. Augustine, right? That's a whole other story. So I think part of it is us celebrating our origin story and our contribution, and each state has got these phenomenal stories. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin's got a great labor story. We would not have half the stuff we have in the labor movement today mm -hmm. without the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate the people who we are and not just wait for 1776 and say, oh, well, we don't have any powdered wigs. We can't do it. <laughs> let's celebrate who we are and let's own it. Nice. <laughs> nice report. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, Christy yeah. Coleman with the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, Scott Stevenson, the Museum of American Revolution mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, no Noel Trent, National Civil Rights Museum, Memphis, Tennessee, and Nat Shidley, mm -hmm. Revolutionary Spaces, Boston, Massachusetts. Our panel. Beautiful. <laughs>